Good morning. It is good to see you here this morning. It is a sad morning because um, you probably saw the email I sent you around uh, in the week uh, that unfortunately Margaret Gillard lost her fight for life on Thursday evening. Um, she was a good friend of a number of people here, the craft group, Eileen in particular, who's with us this morning. Um, Margaret made a huge impact in this church. She was with us for about three and a half years in total, um, but she's got a lifetime of service in the church. That's the broad Catholic church. Uh, so I think it would be wholly appropriate if we started this morning with just a moment of quiet. Uh, then we'll remember Margaret in a prayer uh, and perhaps I can give you some details as to how uh, we can stay in contact with the family. So let's just pause and be quiet for a few moments. Lord, we give thanks for the life of Margaret, for all she was, all she meant to us in her relatively short time here. We give thanks that she saw this church as welcoming with open arms as we're called to be by you. We pray especially for her son Mark as he begins life without his mother, a lonely person and we pray that we're able to offer our support to Mark. It's a time that we remember others when we hear of losses, Lord. So again, as we pause in the quiet, into that space, we offer the names of those that we have lost and still love. We give thanks, Lord, for we are your Easter people and we are offered eternal life through you, for which we praise you. Amen. I did send an email around um, telling everyone uh, about Margaret's sad demise. Um, Eileen's with us this morning. Um, apparently there is some more information. We have the address of Mark. Uh, who is Margaret's son. I know he would welcome messages um, and if you knew Margaret or even if you didn't um, you'll get an email later today and if you want to write uh, and offer condolences that will be wholly appropriate. Eileen, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. Margaret's death was very sudden. Um, she went into hospital on Tuesday and died of leukemia. Unfortunately, the email you'll get will say anemia, but it was leukemia. And it was such a sudden death. It was um, very traumatic for her son Peter because he is a person who lives alone. He never married or anything, a bit like my brother. And um, so if we can uh, be supportive, that would be very good. Her twin sister was with her when she died, and Mark. And of course, COVID just complicates everything, doesn't it? But um, yeah, you should be getting an email from Rose. I asked Rosemary to pass the email round, and you've already had George's. Thank you. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. In worship, let us come to the one who offers peace and rest. And let's again offer a prayer. Against the noise of the world, we cover our ears. 
At distressing sights, we close our eyes. To confusing thoughts, we close our minds. Amid the clamour of distress, we close our hearts. Loving God, your ears and eyes are ever open to our needs. Help us to worship with open hearts and minds that we may have open ears and eyes to see the work that you call us to do and open our hands to do it. Through Jesus we pray and ask your presence at this time of worship. Amen. Be assured that the Lord is with us as we hear our opening song. Be still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. Again we offer our prayers to God. Lord who understands our every need, we adore you for stilling our turmoil, for being the calm in the storm, our anchor in the deep, and the safe port awaiting us always. Lord, you have always been our host. When you first came from heaven to the world, we call ours Shepherds and kings were your guests. When you accepted hospitality in the homes of others, you turned the tables and became the host, feeding hearts and souls through your teaching. When you came to the disciples, newly arisen, you took charge and saw to their needs of mind and body. We praise you, Jesus, ground of our being, ground of our believing, for standing among us in your risen power, host to the world that is yours, not ours. And Lord God, we confess that when we distress and it comes knocking at our door, all that we have learned and should know goes flying out of the window. Our minds in disarray, we fail to turn to trusted sources of help. Forgive us for forgetting how to seek you. 
we forget your sustaining word in scripture your presence when we turn to you in prayer the calm that is to be found when we seek you in community we are sorry for turning in on ourselves our minds going round in circles come risen Lord break the cycle of our despair our understanding is dark clouded by dismay fearful and lacking in faith and yet we know that you will understand Lord shine your light on us and banish the dark thoughts that overwhelm us forgive us the deeds committed while fearful and bewildered and lead us forward in the light of your love we pray especially as we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever Amen in a few minutes Vivian is going to bring us our first Bible reading from the book of Acts and for reassurance you will hear an eyewitness account of the risen Jesus in the gospel reading you are going to hear the two disciples who met the risen Jesus on the Emmaus road and had eaten with him have rushed back the seven miles to Jerusalem to share the news with the rest of the group have a go at thinking about a place seven miles from where you are now say Coventry how long is it going to take you to get there on foot? And after all that had happened, how do you think the two disciples might be feeling when they arrived with their astonishing news? Has anybody ever had to deliver exciting news? Or been present perhaps when somebody else has? What was it like in the room when you or somebody else burst in with amazing news? This is the kind of atmosphere in which the story is taking place and everybody is talking about what the two breathless disciples have just told them. As you listen, take note of any words or phrases that indicate how those present might have been feeling. And think about this too. All the people involved in the resurrection story were called to take action for Jesus. He never told them to go to the synagogue every week. He went himself, presumably, most weeks. We know that from the Gospels. But there were groups of people around who took action. And we need people, not just to come on a Sunday, but we need people to take action. We're very fortunate in this church that we have a number of people who do an awful lot of work for us. We have a wider group of people who do quite a bit for us but we are in need of others to step up and help us with our mission we particularly have a need at the moment for someone to take on the role of lettings officer ask yourselves as you listen to these stories all these action people are you one of the people who could take action and help us with one job mainly computer based these people of action they stood, stood up and they said yes Lord I'm called I will do hear these readings then as Vivian brings us our readings from Acts and from the Gospel of Luke First reading this morning is from Acts chapter 3, verses 12 to 19.
When Peter saw the people, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why are you surprised at this, and why do you stare at us? Do you think it was by means of our own power or godliness that we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has given divine glory to his servant Jesus. But you handed him over to the authorities, and you rejected him in Pilate's presence, even after Pilate had decided to set him free. He was holy and good, but you rejected him, and instead you asked Pilate to do you the favour of turning loose a murderer. You killed the one who leads to life, but God raised him from death, and we are witnesses to this. It was the power of his name that gave strength to this lame man. What you see and know was done by faith in his name. It was faith in Jesus that has made him well, as you can all see. And now, my brothers, I know that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was due to your ignorance. God announced long ago through all the prophets that his Messiah had to suffer, and he made it come true in this way. Repent then and turn to God so that he will forgive your sins. Second reading is from Luke chapter 24 verses 36b to 48. Suddenly the Lord himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were terrified, thinking that they were seeing a ghost. But he said to them, Why are you alarmed? Why are these doubts coming up in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet and see that it is I myself. Feel me and you will know, for a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you can see I have. He said this and showed them his hands and feet. They still could not believe. They were so full of joy and wonder. So he asked them, have you anything here to eat? Which they gave him a piece of cooked fish, which he took and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, these are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms had to come true. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah must suffer and must rise from death three days later. And in his name, the message about repentance and the forgiveness of sins must be preached to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Listen for the word of the Lord. Thank you, Vivian. For the first time I saw John in the theatre, he was playing the role of a manservant. It's good that he's kept in character. Thank you, John. If anybody happens to be going past um, Tannery Court on the way home, we've got our usual copies of the service for the five people there. Uh, you probably know by now, every week, regardless of what happens in the church and what people access um, fr via YouTube, uh, we still send out written copies, and I know that's appreciated by people who receive them. I if nobody's going that way, that's fine. We'll drive back that way. For now, hear a song, Lord Jesus Christ, you have come to us.
wonder if you like ghost stories. I used to know some people, well, I still do know them, I don't see them very often now. They live in a house which is, oh, about 450 years old now, I guess. And it had apparently once been a school a long time ago. And the tale was told that from time to time, you could actually hear children crying up in the loft where the dormitories had been. But neither of the people who live there now have ever heard a thing. This goes back before their times there. I don't know about you, I have never seen a ghost myself, although my mother always claimed she had during the Second World War, apparently, while she was hanging about a cemetery for some reason I never quite got to the bottom of. But I have to admit, my mother did have a highly creative imagination, so I was always a bit suspicious about this story. More credible, though, is the story that I heard this week from Judith, who's with us this morning. And apparently when she was training to be a nurse at the old Coventry and Warwickshire Hospital, that many of you will know, one evening she saw somebody at the end of a corridor in an old nursing uniform, and she was told that this was a ghost who regularly walked around the site. And just to add support to the story, a little while later, Judith tells me, a doctor who was an infrequent visitor arrived, asking where the fancy dress party was, as he had seen the same woman. I admit I do like a good ghost story, and back to the theatre theme, particularly if it's on the stage and well acted and I'm always interested to meet people, and you do, who will admit to having seen ghosts. Most people are more likely to heard, have heard ghostly happenings, apparently, uh, like crying children, as I said before, or even a train where no train now runs, rather than actually having seen some sort of spectre. Since most of us don't see ghosts, it's difficult to know whether to believe in them or not. There are many well-attested accounts, as you know, of the appearance of ghosts and a few photographs to support these accounts, which I'm a bit suspicious of again, I admit. But unless you see one for yourself, you're perhaps left not knowing quite what to believe, really. It seems that, not surprisingly, the first thought to spring to mind when his friends saw Jesus on that very first Easter Sunday, and yes, we are still at Easter Sunday, we are still in the season of Easter, the very first thought was that Jesus was a ghost. But Jesus was a pains to point out that his appearance was not a ghostly appearance. He invited the disciples to touch him. You can't touch a ghost. Your hand would go straight through it since a ghost has no substance at all, apparently. You'll notice how confidently I talk about this, even though I've absolutely no evidence to support what I've just said, but that is what we are called to believe. But this was certainly not the case with Jesus. We're told he was flesh and blood, and he did have substance. And perhaps that was why Thomas, in another incident, said, unless I touch him for myself, I shan't believe. The disciples, of course, were still terrified, so Jesus, ever practical, gave them something mundane and homely to do. He sent them off to cook a piece of fish, both to settle them down and to prove that he actually was real. After all, ghosts have no need of food, apparently. And when they'd eaten together and they were feeling a little more sure of themselves and of Jesus, he immediately began to teach them. He opened the scriptures, we're told, in a new sort of way, just he'd opened the scriptures to those on the road to Emmaus. And it all sounds very normal and just the sort of thing that Jesus did in his life. But if you listen carefully to that story, there are several hints that actually it was very far from normal. He may not have been a ghost, but somehow or other, he appeared in the room, even though we're told the doors were locked. Now, I don't know about you, but in my experience, normal human beings in this life and in this dimension do not walk through locked doors. 
And Jesus, we're told, was fit and well. On the Friday, his injuries had been so horrific that he died from them, was taken down from a cross and put in a tomb with a huge rock rolled across it. And now, here we are on that Sunday, only two days later, although he may have had scars from the wounds, clearly there was no discomfort, no bleeding, he was upright, no pain, walking normally and naturally, and was as fit and healthy as anybody in the room. After all, he had just walked seven miles to Emmaus, and presumably back again, and that's not a journey that you should take if you're unfit. And there seems to have been something different about the way in which he taught the disciples. It appears from the other side of death, Jesus himself has gained tremendous new insight into the scriptures and how they'd been fulfilled in his own case. It had slotted into place for him and he was able to clearly explain all this to his friends. And previously, although he spoke a great deal in parables and stories, much of his teaching was quite obscure and had to be explained to the disciples afterwards. We're told again and again in the Gospels that their minds were dull or that they were blind or that they couldn't understand. But that is not so for the disciples in today's account and neither was it so for the disciples on the road to Emmaus which immediately precedes this account in Luke's Gospel. In both episodes, the disciples immediately grasped what he was telling them. And to quote, they were filled with fervor and excitement and enthusiasm. It was as though they now understood with the heart rather than simply with the mind or with the intellect. So the Jesus who appeared in the upper room on Easter Sunday evening was not the same Jesus who died on Good Friday afternoon, or rather, he was the same, and yet he was quite different. It was certainly Jesus who died, Jesus the son of Mary and Joseph, and who somehow or other passed through death and was seen alive on the other side of death. But this post-death, post-Easter Jesus was different. He was Jesus the Christ, the Saviour, the Messiah. This resurrection of Jesus is a huge stumbling block for many, many people, including Christians. And to be frank, at 2,000 years distance, we shall never know exactly what happened. All we can do is examine the different accounts of the evidence and reach the most likely conclusions. But what we can be certain of is that something happened and that it was possibly of the kingdom of heaven the possibility of the kingdom of heaven in the ordinary of the world help us to enjoy these moments of wonder we ask something momentous something previously utterly unknown had happened and this resurrection of Jesus changed everything the disciples who for the previous three years had a, a kind of belief in Jesus and kind of understood what he was about actually now knew they understood in a completely different way at a completely different level they knew at the very center of their being that jesus was lord and it is the same today whenever people meet with the risen christ those who have spent the whole of their lives kind of believing and kind of understanding suddenly know at a totally different level and in a totally different way that truly Jesus is Lord and like the disciples that new kind of knowing in the center of being changes everything and just as many people are unable to believe in ghosts until or unless they meet one for themselves so it is impossible to know the risen Christ at the center of your being until we meet him for ourselves. No amount of reading the Bible or doing good deeds or even attending church and saying prayers and certainly not listening to me will give you an experience of the risen Christ unless and until you meet him for yourself. 
Once that happens, he changes everything. Once you know at the centre of your being that Jesus is real and it's possible to communicate with him and actually hear him, life is utterly transformed. There is a deep inner happiness, the peace which passes all understanding. There is a very real sense, a source of power, of strength, and life becomes eternal life, experienced right here, right now. And that is what is on offer to us as Easter people, to those who meet with the resurrected Lord. And compared with that, the actual mechanics of resurrection suddenly become much less important. For you find out for yourselves that the risen Christ is no ghost, but a Holy Spirit which dwells within each and every one of us. Amen. I suspect like all of you I shall be really pleased when we can sing together, we can be joyful together, we'll have somebody playing the organ, hopefully Bob. But until then we have to make do with recorded music. On the other hand, it does give us an opportunity perhaps to be exposed to music that we wouldn't normally sing or listen to in church. Maybe you've heard this song before, if not, enjoy. What wonderful gift is this? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? Free. 
Let's come to God again with our prayers for others. You know we have a prayer book and every Sunday Joe is uh, at the door and if you wish to add names to the prayer book please feel free and we'll use them at this time in the service. Risen Christ, your living presence is celebrated at city gates and market squares by those in need of healing and those who are amazed in heart and minds. In moments of wonder and unexpected changes, our senses are disrupted by the extraordinary, so that suddenly we see you standing in our midst, speaking words of peace and inspiring your world to discover the possibility of the kingdom of heaven in the ordinary of this world. Help us to enjoy our moments of wonder. In a world where explanation and logic could chip away at faith, may we marvel at the growing knowledge of science and the wonder it creates, from starlit skies to molecules and atoms, giving intimate knowledge of a creation so full of opportunities to delve into discovering more of you, our God. Thrill us with the mystery of what we are yet to know, so that it expands our desire to notice you in unexpected ways and places. In this journey through a pandemic, we give thanks for all those who have offered signs of resurrection in their work and commitments. We pray for doctors, for nurses and support staff who tirelessly care for those who enter their view, at times with potential harm to themselves. We pray for the scientific community as it continues research and development in care and prevention. We pray for those who are the recipients of care and notice the wide range of people whose health has been affected by being unable to receive treatment and support. Help us to recognise that while the virus has worldwide impact, we are not equal in immunisation programmes. Help us to notice those communities who will be the last to receive the support they need and to work towards the fairer share of wealth and resources so that your risen presence reveals the kingdom in every land. Christ of life and death and resurrection, we celebrate those who have shared this life with us, allowing us to meet you in simple words and actions. We grieve with those who mourn the death of loved ones. May we be those who share the memories and love that allows us hope to rise from loss. This morning we have already remembered our friend Margaret Gillard and we pray again, Lord, for her family. We pray for Felicity, John's sister, we pray for Gordon Watkins and give thanks that he seems to be recovering well. We think of our friend Winnie, who we haven't seen for so long in this church, now awaiting results. And we pray for Winnie and all like her who have been in isolation for over a year now. We give thanks that Joy, Joy Verrill is back at home after her fall. We continue to pray for Joe and John. We pray for Eileen, such a good friend to Margaret. We pray for Frank, Cheryl's brother, who is poorly in Zimbabwe. We give thanks for the life of the Duke of Edinburgh whose service many of us were able to share in yesterday and we pray for our Queen and their family and in a moment of silence we offer others we know who are in need of feeling your healing caring touch Lord. All our prayers we have offered in the name of Jesus Christ, your risen one. 
Amen. I'm thrilled to be able to tell you that uh, from Wednesday until Sunday next week, or this coming week, uh, Judith and I are going to have a few days away. She's much more deserving of it than I am, as you know, but nevertheless, it will be good to have a break. Why am I telling you this? Not to gloat, honestly, uh, but to tell you that if anything uh, that I need to know happens, uh, my telephone still works, usually in deepest Norfolk. Um, I will be uh, able to be contacted by email, and I've already assured Mark, Margaret's son, uh, that I'm available if he needs to talk as well. So feel free to stay in contact in the usual way. For now, let's hear our closing song. All the room was hushed and still.
Jesus said to his disciples, Peace be with you. And they responded with turmoil. Jesus said, Have you anything to eat? They served him fish. Jesus opened their minds. They became his witnesses. So, Lord, may we too find peace in your service with open minds and hearts on fire. We go in peace, protected by God, befriended by Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and held by the prayers of the people of this place, and the blessing of the Holy Trinity go with you now and always. Amen.